We do think that APRA has a role to play, uh, particularly the Nursing and Midwifery Board. Personal care work, at least certainly in the residential setting, is a subset of nursing work. It's work delegated by nurses according to care plans created by nurses. And it's in fact the same work I did as a nurse in 1986. So it, um, ARPA already regulate people who are vet educated, enrolled nurses for example are vet diploma educated, it's not only tertiary qualified people. It's an embedded system, it, as I said nurses have to delegate work to people who are competent to do the work and without the board telling, the current, the current qualification for example is delivered badly, and I think there's plenty of evidence that, of that to this commission is being delivered badly by some RTOs. If you become regulated by APRA, particularly the NMBA, then the deliverer of the course is also has to be approved by the NMBA. So it adds a degree of, of safety and quality. Um, criminal police checks, you know, they have a place, but what um, professional registration achieves is, is a fit and proper person kind of test. And to give an example of that, um, as a nurse, I can't go out, well I can, but I get into trouble, if I go out saying, don't get vaccinated, it'll cause autism. Or is it the other way around? Anyway, no, it's that way. Um, if I do that, I can be subject to, to um, consequences by the board. That's not a criminal thing to do. That's professional behaviour. And I think what we see as the vision, if you like, is a workforce that's well paid, proud, um, that the community has confidence and trust in, uh, and they're all things that can't happen in isolation from several things happening at once, of which we say registration is one. And the Commonwealth supporting the cost of that is another, and transitional arrangements for people's qualifications, different English language standard is another. Until very recently, and it's still the case even now, that if you accept that someone having a base qualification of a Certificate 3 uh, is desirable to work in aged care, we still get pushback today from employers saying, well, I don't require my employees to hold a Cert 3, so I'm not going to pay the rate of play that applies to someone who has a Cert 3. So even though the agreement, because the, most of the agreements are based on the award that see if the employer requires you to have a Cert 3, you get paid this amount. So the employers say, we don't require you to have one. How, so common, how common is that? It's increasingly less common because our enterprise agreements focus, focus hard on it to make sure it goes away. And it's just been dealt with, I think, in a, in a award uh, award review that some of the employers might be able to speak to more broadly than me because we don't have anybody who's covered by that award, so it's a bit... And, you know. and, and what sort of person are we talking about? Are we talking about a personal carer? Yes, personal carers, yeah. And employers tell you they don't need them to have any qualification? Correct. And what sort of employers, without naming them, are we talking about large organisations or small organisations? I think, I think the common denominator is probably the person, who, people who represent those large, those small employers. So it's not it's not something we hear from the the more corporate employers. It's the the more um, backyard variety. The regulation of the workforce would be a big step forward in that space, with all of the uh, points I, that everyone has made about the poor, the low pay, the English language test, those sorts of things that you'll no doubt go into this afternoon. I think it has the capacity to generate a clear career path for people. Uh, in aged care, either within aged care or across other parts of the of health, which I think is a good thing because if somebody doesn't want to work in aged care, then they shouldn't be there. Um, so giving people career opportunities, width-wise and height-wise, is a good thing.